My name's Keith Haynes. I work at the University of Reading and as part of the National Centre for Earth Observation. Uh, ocean reanalysis is something I used to do myself until about 2010 when we decided that it wasn't really possible to keep that sort of thing going at a university. And um, uh, so mostly we work with uh, um, the Met Office or the European Centre. Um, and m my background is in o ocean data assimilation. Um, not so much from a forecasting point of view, but really to try to understand the analysis that you get out of combining data with models and trying to learn something about the circulation and the climate from that. So that will set the context for mostly of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so as an outline of my talk, uh, I'll just start off with a few, discussing a few terms. Um, this is about ocean reanalysis, so we'll say what an analysis is and what a reanalysis is, and then other terms like state estimation that are uh, sometimes used um, in a similar context. Uh, review of assimilated data sets and their availability, uh, and some ocean reanalysis products that are out there in the community. Um, I shall then sort of start to look at ocean reanalysis metrics, um, examples from the Copernicus program in Europe. Um, and really, uh, you, you can think of two sorts of metrics here, uh, metrics against the data that you're actually assimilating, and then against independent data, against things that you haven't measured, but you would like to know if you can trust these reanalyses to give you good estimates of. Um, I'll say quite a bit about the Ocean Reanalysis Intercomparison Project because this is something that we've been working on now for um, a number of years to try to uh, really take the, some of the ocean reanalyses that are out there in the community and compare them and try to understand uh, where they're similar, where they're different, and really can we trust them to give us uh, back things that we're interested in understanding in the ocean and in the climate system. Um, and uh, the next section, really learning from reanalysis products, examples, and I'll look a lot at things like uh, ocean heat content, uh, the transports that you get out of ocean reanalyses, um, and whether you can learn anything from the data assimilation increments that are involved in producing them. And then at the end, I'll just say a little bit about longer-term reanalyses. You're, you're probably aware that in the, uh, the climate community and the atmospheric community are going towards 20th century reanalyses over a very long periods of time. And of course, also uh, IPCC and uh, the uh, operational services are going towards decadal prediction, where you need several decades to work out whether you can do anything sensible from the past. So again, you need to be able to look quite a far back in time uh, to put in place the ocean components for that. So I also realise that the order that you're getting this talk is uh, you haven't really been giving any uh, presentation about data assimilation yet. I think that comes next week. I'm not going to focus very much on data assimilation at all. I'm really going to focus on the products um, that come out of it. But of course, it's, it's vital for uh, the reanalysis activity. Um, OK, so that's the outline. So just a few terms, analysis and reanalysis. Well, operational weather centres, of course, uh, are always doing atmospheric analyses in order to do predictions. Uh, such places like ECMWF and NSEP and in Japan and Australia, they're all sort of assimilating and producing analyses of the atmospheric state from which to launch short-term predictions. So that's essentially involves taking a background from your model and introducing new data to it to update it with the, the best current observations before you launch a forecast. Um, now, of course, these operational um, uh, forecast centers are always updating their systems. So uh, always the models are being updated with improved parameterizations, improved error methods for the assimilation, etc. cetera. Um, so it's very much a constantly changing system. So if you went and back in time and you looked at the analysis that a, a weather forecast center would produce today and compare it with the analysis that was produced six or seven years ago, um, even if the data that was going into that system was exactly the same, you'd have a different analysis. So uh, that's not really good if you want to look at changes over time. Obviously, we can't avoid the data sets themselves changing over time, but um, uh, the whole idea of a reanalysis is to try to take a frozen 
um, a frozen analysis system, that's a frozen model and a frozen data assimilation system, and use it to reconstruct a history um, of what we think the atmosphere or the ocean was doing over a period of time. And just to do that with the best, so we're, we're, of course we're forced to use old data, but we're using the best modern models and analysis uh, and assimilation systems that we have. Um, this is quite an expensive process. Um, assimilating large data sets into models now for operational work is, is, is a significant part of the operational procedure. It's not just the forecast, it actually quite a lot of computational effort is going in each day to produce the analysis. And if you want to do that over 10, 20, 30 years of history, it's, it's very expensive. So again, this is something that uh, takes a lot of resources, computational resources to do, and a lot of data resources as well, of course. And finally, um, uh, there's these issues of are reanalyses useful for climate studies? And I think uh, all we can say is perhaps, but uh, great care is needed because of the change, even if the analysis system is very good, the change in quality of the observations through time uh, will always play a role. Okay, so just ocean reanalysis and state estimation. So ocean reanalyses are doing exactly the same as you would do for an atmospheric reanalysis. It's a sequential a uh, short data window approach where you're taking a background field and you're putting in new observations. Um, the things that you're updating are things like water properties and currents, and you're doing that with increments. You're going in and changing the, uh, uh, the state of the ocean as represented, the temperature and salinity fields in the current fields. Um, but we also know that the ocean's a little different from the atmosphere. Um, it uh, has very long thermodynamic timescales of years, decades, perhaps even centuries. And that's essentially because water masses, once they leave contact with the surface and enter the deeper parts of the ocean, um, they move very adiabatically. Only, uh, uh, um, only mixing can really change those properties. And therefore, there's a long potential information storage mechanism in the ocean. Um, and you'd like to access that. So. Um, uh, there is another approach to producing these uh, kind of long histories of the ocean state. It's called ocean state estimation. It aims to use long window approaches, maybe five years or more, where you try to analyze five years or more of data all at the same time. Um, uh, essentially, the way this works is because you're not introducing increments into your system, which are, of course, artificial. Uh, the argument is that you can trace what's going on in your model much more effectively by doing that. So effectively, these are tuned simulations where you vary the winds and the surface fluxing and perhaps the interior mixing in order to fit the data history as well as you can. Um, and the, uh, the ECHO consortium has been doing this for uh, um, a couple of decades, probably. Um, looking at uh, improving the, uh, the methodology for this approach. It's hard to do in high-resolution models, uh, essentially because as you go to high resolution, the models become chaotic, so it's quite difficult to solve these long window problems. So you might ask which approach is better. Um, that's a very hard question to answer. I think really uh, the sorts of questions that you can answer is do they agree well with the data, both the assimilated and the independent data? Uh, do we believe the circulation patterns that they produce? Um, and really, I think over the last uh, five or so years, we've come to accept that we should take these products both from state estimation and from the more conventional reanalysis approach and put them together and compare them. So this used to divide the community quite a lot. I think it's, that's less of a problem now where we understand what we really need to do is to put them together and ask, do we believe the, the circulation patterns that are coming out? Um, so there are strengths and weaknesses to both these approaches, um, but I think the, the real test is can we believe the circulation patterns that they produce. So just quickly, ocean assimilation data sets. Um, you can see here that uh, if you consider the in situ hydrographic data sets, of course nowadays we're, um, we're dominated by the Argo float program, which is a fantastic upper ocean um, uh, program that uh, monitors uh, temperature and salinity down to two kilometers or so. Um, this is supplemented, of course, by mooring array, particularly in the tropics, which have been used for a couple of decades now, mainly for, uh, for El Nino forecasting, and this is also a, a critical part of the uh, observing system. Um, 
Argoin particularly, though, has only been present really for the last 10 years or so. If you go back to the pre-Argo period, um, the coverage in the ocean has been uh, much less. Um, essentially, we take these data uh, um, essentially in databases now, for example, the World Ocean Atlas or Coriolis or EN4 at the Hadley Center. Um, those, those data, the older data in particular, they're dominated by temperature data. Um, they also tend to be much shallower than the uh, two kilometers that we can get from Argo, except for research vessels, a lot of the uh, temperature data is XBT data, so it's, it's much shallower. Um, also, the quality of, that of uh, that, those data sets are variable, and indeed there's a big international program which is trying to look back over the history of in situ data, the iQuad program, to try to quality control some of the older data, because if you want to get a consistent history, you need to do that. Um, if you look at sea surface temperature, of course, we have these wonderful high-resolution pictures now, um, and sea surface temperature is one of the oldest uh, oceanographic data sets that we've had, um, as uh, sea surface temperature measurements were taken from space from 1979 onwards. Obviously, older products are based on ship data and tend to be used through um, pre-assimilated products like Haddis II, so these are used for some of the long period reanalyses. Um, one should say that SST is very much a, a boundary data set, and uh, assimilating it correctly into these reanalysis products is still an issue. Um, I'll mention that again when we come to the end, because really, to assimilate sea surface temperature correctly with its correct errors is really a coupled modeling process and a coupled reanalysis process. And I think in future, uh, this is something that we'll readdress again, the community will readdress over the next few years as to, as to how to really use these SST data sets more effectively. And of course altimetry, which has been the mainstay of operational oceanography, has been present since 92 onwards. Um, and you have these fantastic pictures of uh, when more than one altimeter were flying at a time, Jason 1 and Jason 2 giving these coverages, although you can still see the tracks and you can still see the gaps. Um, uh, it's been a wonderful uh, uh, data set to use for upper ocean circulation. Other things that are relevant for reanalyses, things like uh, sea ice extent at high latitudes, these have been measured uh, by satellite, of course, um, uh, and uh, are more and more being assimilated because, of course, uh, big changes are going on, particularly in the Arctic, and uh, being able to model that ice cover is, is critical to the... Uh, evolution of not only the Arctic, but also uh, lower latitudes as well. Surface salinity, you've heard a couple of talks about this um, uh, this week, particularly by Tony. Um, uh, SMOS, Aquarius, SMAP, uh, their work is ongoing to include these products, but of course the time history is quite short, so they're not really part of a reanalysis program as such at the moment. Although the history of changing salinities um, in, the, in the oceans um, and its uh, uh, relevance to the global water cycle of, is of course extremely interesting. And then bottom pressure, GRACE, um, is telling us very much about large movements of, uh, of water um, around the globe. For example, during El Nino events, there's large redistributions of, of water mass around the globe. Um, although again, most of the reanalyses uh, uh, products do not use these data sets at the moment. Okay, just quickly, a few um, ocean reanalyses. This is, uh, there's many more uh, uh, than on this list. Uh, this list is just part of a particular intercomparison uh, project that's ongoing at the moment. Um, the only things I want to point out is that uh, there's uh, a number of different models here. Uh, there's several NEMO models. There's uh, a couple of models from the US. Uh, there's a, a model from Japan here. So different models are going into this, these reanalyses. Uh, there are different assimilation schemes being used. Um, the atmospheric forcing is probably more uniform than many, although there are still uh, several different um, atmospheric forcing data sets being used. For example, ERA Interim or NSEP or the MERA2 product from, from NASA. And so again, all of these things can contribute to making a difference to what comes out at the end. So it really depends upon how much these things matter compared with how much of the data uh, that's going in matter. Because of course we, uh, we hope uh, that to a large extent the data that's being assimilated by these uh, systems are fairly similar, um, at least in, uh, 
in recent periods. Okay, so moving on to data assimilation metrics. Um, fitting the data, first of all, I, I took this from the uh, Copernicus quality control document, so it's really only for one reanalysis. This is the, uh, the Mercator Glories uh, uh, V4 product. Um, and what you can see here is over time, from 92 through to 2015, I think, uh, this is the RMS temperature, global temperature as a function of depth, um, global salinity as a function of depth. This is the RMS error on the right and the bias on the left. Um, and you can see here that, of course, What's going on is that there's big changes in these, uh, in these errors, um, or these misfits, I should say, um, that take place as the Argo data comes in. So immediately, uh, as Argo comes in, you, you start to lose a lot of the, the errors, reduce gr a great deal um, uh, sort of, uh, in the upper ocean. There are still seasonal errors near the surface in the top 100 meters or so. Uh, uh, which you can see there. Uh, you can see uh, in, they're in the same place as these salinity errors that you can see on the right-hand side, the salinity biases that you can see. Um, you can see dipoles, which is sort of makes you suspect that there might be some mixing issues uh, in these models, which wouldn't be surprising, although it's, you've got to be careful um, when you look at a global picture like this. The, the, these might be coming from different locations around the globe, but uh, you, you can see how you might start to try and interpret what's going on in some of these products. Also, of course, if you look deeper than Argo, even in the more recent period, wherever you've got actual deep observations, the models still aren't doing very well. And of course, not surprisingly, that you, you haven't got very much going in here, so when you do get new data, it's usually telling you the model is quite wrong. Um, but uh, So those are the sorts of uh, data sets you can lo look at. But of course, this is data that you're actually putting in. If you actually look at circulation and transports, which I think is one of the things you'd really like to get out of these reanalyses, because largely you're not measuring these things. If you just want to know what the temperature distribution in the ocean is on a large scale, then of course you can go to a, a data-only product now, because the Argo uh, data set is very good in most parts of the ocean. Uh, but if you actually want to look at circulation, you really need to look at a model um, data combined product in some way. So this is some circulation and transport analyses from reanalyses uh, in the ocean. Again, these are from CMEMS, so uh, just the top 15 meters, which of course we have from drifter data in the ocean. So this is uh, this is the reanalysis on the right hand side, the left hand side. We've got um, drifter data on the right hand side, and you can see that uh, although you're uh, this is zonal currents, I think. So although you're getting uh, uh, the sort of dominant uh, current patterns are certainly in there, but you can see that certainly at higher latitudes, for example, there's, there are many differences that you can see. If you go at, uh, into the deeper ocean, perhaps the only place where we have, uh, we can actually use the Argo drift velocities at about at 1,000 meters uh, to compare the, this is now, this is the uh, kinetic, mean kinetic energy at these depths. And again, you can see some correspondence, but now, in, in fact, whereas before in the upper ocean, you can see that, uh, the, the real drifters are a rather noisier and more variable product than the reanalyses. Seems to some extent the reverse is true when you go down here, although this, of course, may be partly due to the limited uh, um, uh, uh, amount of data that you have from the Argo uh, program. But uh, you can certainly see that, I mean, you're getting variability in the, in the right places, um, but perhaps uh, in more variable places, particularly in the Southern Ocean, for example, and in the North Atlantic. If you look at other things like the uh, meridional overturning circulation, and I'll return quite a lot to this, um, this is one place, this is in, in the North Atlantic, we now have a, an array of, uh, that's been set up uh, with moorings across 26 North, either end of this section, um, which allows one to monitor uh, the transports in the upper and the deep ocean. And of course, in the North Atlantic, you've got a, you've got a northward circulation at upper levels and a deep circulation that's coming south. Uh, and that's transporting a lot of heat in the Atlantic. And so we really need to understand whether our models can get that, because this could be critical for longer term climate type uh, predictions. So um, uh, this, you can see a comparison here, uh, where the, the actual rapid data is in red, 
the reanalysis data is in blue. Um, you're getting a lot of the uh, annual cycle here, but a lot of that is produced by, uh, just by the winds. It's, it's driven by uh, Ekman pumping. What you really want to see is the, whether you're getting the geostrophic part of the circulation correct. And there's quite a lot of work now going on to try and compare reanalyses with these kinds of data sets, because this is really telling you about the, whether the, uh, the products are, are, are producing consistent transports, which is what you'd really like them to do. Just quickly, this is quite an old picture now, but I still, uh, still like it. It shows you um, how the, uh, the current systems can be reproduced in a, uh, when you assimilate data. So this is actually a, an old WOS comparison on section P14, which goes north-south through, uh, uh, through the Pacific Ocean. Um, uh, this, was a, uh, this is from a quarter of a degree model. So this is a, a model that's run uh, without any data being assimilated, and this is just showing you the zonal currents uh, um, in July or around July 1993. You can see, in fact, that uh, the the model left to its own devices. It's it's got eddies, but it hasn't. It's not terribly active. Um, it's got a, a, a an equatorial undercurrent system there, but it's too uh, it's too deep and it's not strong enough. When you assimilate profile data, and this is, remember, this is pre-Argo, so, um, but you're assimilating XPT data, um, and you're assimilating the tau data, um, immediately you get a much better equatorial undercurrent, so you're, you're improving the, um, uh, uh, the, the strength of the mean circulation, where it's driven there. You still don't get much in the way of eddies at higher latitudes, and then when you combine the profile data with altimeter data, you start to get all these nice eddy features in mid-latitudes. And just to show, this is the uh, ADCP that was on board the WOS ship at the time that it, uh, it made the section. And you can see that uh, from the altimeter data, you are now picking up a lot of these currents. Um, so that's a very nice demonstration of how the combination of the two different data sets are giving you the upper ocean circulation. There are still problems up here at higher latitudes. Um, this is above 45 degrees north here. The ocean's becoming less stratified up here, um, and we're unable to produce a lot of those uh, currents in the... This, this was obviously quite an old assimilation system that was being used here. But this is still a challenge today to, to reproduce uh, a, a good circulations at high latitudes, you, you, even using... We've got good altimetry up here, but assimilating into the model, where, which have, is very barotropic, is still quite challenging. Okay, so the, um, we talked about uh, the uh, ocean reanalysis into comparison project. This was originally set up by uh, Clivar and Goudet um, to try to compare some of the ocean reanalysis products. Uh, many groups were involved in this. It started off around 2011, and what we decided to do that was the best approach was that uh, uh, each group would take a, a variable and start to look um, uh, in the uh, various reanalysis products at that variable and compare them and try to decide um, whether there was uh, whether they were agreeing with each other, whether they were disagreeing, um, uh, and whether there were outliers. Uh, it, it would actually and, and compare against independent data where that was available. So you can see a list of variables that were looked at. You can see down here that. Um, uh, there's quite a variety of things that were looked at. There are uh, six observation-only products in this comparison. There's a whole list of, uh, of model products here. Um, 13 low-resolution model reanalysis products, eight high-resolution products. That def might be defined as a third or a quarter of a degree. Um, four coupled data assimilation products. And six of the, only six of those were long reanalysis runs starting from the 50s. Most of these are short runs starting from the operational oceanography era, if you like, from the, from the altimetry period of 1992-93 onwards. Um, so now uh, we, there is, a, there is a, com, um, a volume of climate dynamics, a special issue which contains quite a number of papers uh, that resulted from this project. And the project is still going on. Uh, there's uh, further work going on, particularly to look at the polar oceans, for example. And there's still very little has been done on transports uh, and currents, uh, because these are things that we, uh, we'd really like to know. We'd, we'd, we, we still have difficulty knowing whether we're getting those correct in the models. Um, another outcome of this project was that there, we have a data server where you can actually get 
a number of re a lot of these reanalysis products um, all in the same place. And so the uh, the data server at Hamburg has uh, uh, volunteered to run this ocean reanalysis into comparison project access. Uh, and a lot of the data sets that were compared have been uploaded here so people can actually go to them and, uh, and get the data. I should also say that um, there, is a, uh, there is a site uh, run uh, from NOAA which is uh, a real-time multiple ocean reanalysis into comparison. That seems a bit of a contradiction in a way that a reanalysis is a history, whereas I, I think part of this is really to, to try to put the real-time analyses in a context of a historical situation, which of course in most places you're not getting, you're just getting what the, what the, the current analysis or forecast is, whereas what... So these, these are all really centers which are focusing on seasonal forecasting, and a lot of the indices on here are indices based around the tropical Pacific, but there are some, there are some, uh, uh, some uh, more global pictures, and this is, this is one of them, for example. This, is, uh, from, this can be downloaded from the site now. You can see that it's for August 2007, so the last uh, just a month ago, um, and it's got the upper ocean 300 meter heat content anomalies from six different uh, centers there. So this is all from a, uh, from a long period uh, climatology. There are anomalies from a climatology. Um, and then you've got an ensemble mean product looking at the average of all of those and a signal to noise ratio. So trying to look at where the, the average product, um, uh, where the signal stands out about above the noise, the spread amongst the different products. You can see that despite having good data here, we've, there's still quite a lot of variability in, uh, in uh, these, uh, these products. And whether that's uh, the extent of that is due to the way the models are run or the way the, uh, the data is assimilated, is, uh, I, I can't answer that. OK, so looking at what we can learn from these reanalysis products, this was a paper from uh, ECMWF. Um, published in 2013, just looking at their, uh, at that time, current Aura S4 product, and looking at the ocean heat content anomalies in the global ocean, uh, and it's anomalies from the early period, 58 to 65. And there's a lot that you can see going on in here. Um, you can see, for example, these orange bars are showing positions where major volcanic eruptions occurred, um, and you can see that uh, there's significant co cooling of the global ocean at those times. This uh, one, you can see very uh, nicely also the, the large El Nino um, in uh, 98 or so, which also shows a, a marked cooling as, as heat is released from the tropical Pacific Ocean. Um, the previous very large El Nino, of course, in 82, was pretty much concurrent with El Shishon, so it, it's, it, you can't easily sort of separate those signals. Uh, the other thing that you can see here is that the data is separated by depth. So you can see how the ocean is wa the upper ocean is warming um, uh, in uh, the 300 meters, 700 meters, and total depth. And I think the interesting thing that they uh, point out here is that a lot of the warming is not confined to the upper layers. So a lot of the um, a lot of the warming, particularly in the later period, if you look at the earlier period. Um, it, it would seem that the volcanic responses and the uh, El Nino responses are pretty much confined to the upper layer. So if you look at the black, the, the changes in the black line, the top 300 meters, it's pretty much the same change as you go from the top 300 meters to deeper layers of the ocean. But when you look at the, the, this large global warming signal that's taking off now, you can see that uh, there's a substantial contribution from deeper in the ocean. So that's... Uh, Perhaps that's uh, an argument for saying that uh, you can then try and do further studies to understand how that heat is getting downwards uh, and where that's going. So that's just one reanalysis. This is also, of course, then the sort of thing that we try to look at in the ocean reanalysis into comparison. And this is a paper by uh, Matt Palmer. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see the interannual variability in many of these ocean reanalysis products. This is for the short period of time, 93 to 2009. If you remember, I said that the products were only available for a fairly short time, um, most of them. Uh, you can see the ECMWF product down the bottom there. That's the one that we just looked at at high resolution. Um, and you can see whether some of the other reanalysis products are giving you a similar picture. Um, some of them do, not all of them. 
but you can see that uh, many of them are, particularly if you focus on the, um, well, this is, this is actually a, a, a data-only product, but if you focus on the end period, because many of them are, are confined to this end period, you can see quite a lot of the warming is coming in from the deep ocean and is not confined just to the shallow layers. And that's the sort of thing that uh, was of great interest to see whether uh, um, the reanalyses can reproduce that. Not all of them do that, actually. Some of them are the, the heat content is confined more to the upper layers. So that's the sort of thing that you might try to use reanalyses for. This was another, um, this was another paper that was uh, looking at the global heat flux from these uh, reanalysis products. Now, um, what this is showing, we, we know that on average the Earth is heating up from the Argo program of, at a rate of around, um, over the oceans, about one watt per meter squared. Um, so can you actually see these sorts of signals in the ocean reanalysis products? Well, not, not really on, on this basis. The, what this is doing is showing you the, uh, the balances in the global ocean uh, heat products. So on the left-hand side, you've got a number of reanalysis products. On the right-hand side, you've got independent products from, uh, from data sets, for example, um, uh, re uh, atmospheric reanalysis data data sets, and also from a um, uh, combination of observational products. You can see the combination of observational products don't really uh, define the global average uh, uh, heat flux very well. They can easily be out uh, to, uh, to levels of 20 watts per meter squared over the globe. And we know, of course, that's wrong. And that's simply reflecting the fact that we haven't got observations that really constrain this very well. The atmospheric reanalysis products tend to be better but they're still, uh, they're still at the levels of 10 watts per meter squared or so. And if you look at the ocean reanalysis products, they tend to be rather better balanced, actually, than the atmospheric products. And if you actually look at, uh, what, uh, is, if you actually look at what the uh, balance is made up of, you can see that most of these products um, tend to have a net warming produced by the surface fluxes balanced by a cooling from the data assimilation increment. So leaving a, a net warming somewhere around here, these little green bars, which isn't, you know, this, these are not far out from what we think is really going on in terms of the global ocean heat content changes. But it is made up of the assimilation increments are balancing the, uh, the surface fluxes. And that's not a, that's really, you'd like to get to a point where that um, cons consistent bias was not present in the data sets. Okay, so going back to these issues of transports. So I said earlier that I think um, this is something we'd really like to uh, get a better handle on from these products because it's something that we generally we're not measuring very well. So one of the things that was done um, was to look at the Atlantic overturning in these, uh, these reanalysis products. Um, only six products were originally used for, and for the period 1960 to 2007. And you can see here, so these are only the, only the long period reanalysis products were used. These are the Atlantic overturnings. You can see these are the, the, the time mean stream functions from the different long period products. There's a lot of variation between them. Um, and the point that was made is that if you compare these, for, if you compare that rate of variability with the variability within a set of model simulations, the, the model simulations are actually more similar to one another. That doesn't mean they're right, of course, but clearly the data assimilation process, rather than actually bringing these products together as far as this quantity is concerned, they're actually increasing the variability and they end up further apart. So maybe that's not the, what you'd really like to get out of this. Um, you can see also the time variability of the, uh, of the overturning at a particular latitude, 26 north, which is where we're, of course, trying to monitor it with the rapid array now. So that wasn't a very positive result for the, for the products, but let's, let's go on and look in a bit more detail at the rapid array itself. And um, so here is an example where, um, well, first of all, just to show this is, this, is the, uh, this is the mooring data set that's out in the North Atlantic now that's being used to monitor the overturning. Um, and it's been in the water since 2004. We hope it'll stay there. Uh, for, for another decade or more, because long-period records like this are actually critical. And 
This is one particular reanalysis. So you can see here, this is the, uh, the Met Office Glossy 5 product at 26 North in red with some, with some time averaging. And if you look at that, you'd say, well, actually, that seems to be doing quite well um, in comparison with the... So that's the black line is the reanalysis. The red line is the observations from this array. So you'd say, well, we're, we're doing rather well. And, and uh, Laura Jackson produced a paper in Nature saying just that and also saying that essentially we can understand this slowdown as a, a response to long-term changes, interdecadal changes um, in, the, uh, in the circulation rather than a signature of collapse of the AMOP, for example. Um, so, that's, so that's interesting. It, it, it seems that it is possible to get somewhere near the observations with these, uh, with these reanalysis products. Um, is, is this a fluke? Um, it might, it might be. <laughs> I'm, uh, uh, I think the jury is very much out on that. If you actually look at the, um, if you actually look at other latitudes, you will find that uh, uh, perhaps the, these products can can look good in, in some places and not in others. Um, but anyway, buoyed by that nice comparison, um, further work's been going on at the Met Office to try to understand whether some of this variability can be used to do heat budget analyses in the North Atlantic. And here you can see, uh, this is some work that Leslie Allison has been doing. Um, we know, for example, that uh, the, uh, the subpolar gyre of the North Atlantic has been cooling since about 2005. Uh, over the sort of a long period of cooling has been going on. Um, uh, uh, there's a paper by Robson which sort of describes that and also says that this can be, uh, this can be linked to processes of deep water formation uh, and the slowdown of the AMOC uh, produced, well, deep water formation produced in the Labrador Sea and the consequent driving of a slowing thermohaline circulation. And you can do that in climate model simulations. Um, so the question is, can we, can we understand the variability um, that you're seeing in the top, can we actually look at changes in the ocean heat content that that's producing? So this is, um, this is missing some text, but it's coming in now, that's good, okay. Uh, so what has been done here, this is a, a, a ocean heat content for the region 25 to 45 north, and you can see here the different contributions of the, um, to, the, uh, to the heat content in that, in that region. Um, in different lines here. So it's a, it's a bit messy. Um, the black line is the dominant line, and that's actually showing you the heat content um, in that region, in the reanalysis, and it's very noisy. Uh, and it's noisy because of the blue line, which is essentially the assimilation increments. So the assimilation increments on short time scales are doing most to vary the ocean heat content. And that may be as you might expect, because there's a lot of data that's going in each month, and it's changing uh, uh, the properties of the water as observed. So you can see that the, uh, the ocean's getting cooler, it's getting warmer through here, that part, this part of the ocean, it's cooling again and then warming again. Um, but what you can also see, that in certain periods, um, these other lines, particularly the blue line and the red line, are the heat input across the northern and southern boundary, um, and then the green line is the surface flux. And so what you can see in this period, for example, um, in period three, uh, the reduction, this reduction in ocean heat content, uh, although there's a the component that's coming from the increments, you can also see that uh, there's a component that's coming from the surface fluxes, which is cooling the, 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 the water here, and also a component that's coming from reduced transport across 25 north, this, uh, this uh, rapid section, if you like. So all three things are contributing to cooling of the ocean in this region. And I, I think that we can believe this because there, there, are, there have been other um, studies which have shown that uh, more or less equal contributions from surface cooling or less surface heating um, and, uh, uh, and uh, transports uh, to the changes in heat content which were going on over here. Um, and you can do that by looking at the depth structures. So obviously, uh, heat content changes from surface fluxes tend to be confined near the surface, um, and whereas transports uh, can have more of a depth structure which you can identify if you look carefully at the observations. So, so that's the subtropical heat budget, and uh, you can do something similar for the subpolar heat budget. And again, 
Uh, you can see that a lot of the short time scales are affected by the data assimilation flux, but you can also see long time scale changes in transports, uh, which are explaining um, some of the cooling in the, um, in the subpolar gyre uh, during the, uh, that latter period, from, from re really from, uh, from around 2005 onwards. Okay, so just going in, a, just trying to look a little bit more at these circulation issues. This is some work that's been done in the South Atlantic now. Um, really, the South Atlantic is very interesting because, of course, it's the it's the only major basin in which you've got heat transport from it, from the uh, polar regions to the equator. Because of the overturning circulation, you've got a northward heat transport through the South Atlantic. So this is a comparison in the period 97 to 2010. Um, and what you can see here for four different reanalysis products and from two model simulations, one at a, twelfth of, uh, one at a quarter of a degree and one at a twelfth of a degree, is the zonal mean... Um, oops, that's not good. <laughs> that's not good. <laughs> okay. That means I should speed up and let you go to dinner. <laughs> so, uh, so that is the um, that's the zonal mean temperature uh, error in the upper ocean. The simulations have quite large zonal mean temperature errors. The assimilation products are much closer to observations, as you'd expect. Um, but if you actually look at the overturning strength, they're very variable between these models. Um, and you could actually could somebody bring a if somebody's got a power plug for this it might help. Collapsing. It's a Toshiba. Uh, sorry, it's a Toshiba. Yes. No. Nope. Okay. So, so the reanalyses are increasing the the uh, uh, the overturning here, but uh, not consistently. There's still great variability between the reanalyses. However, if we look at the East to west accumulated transports from 0 to 1,000 meters, um, integrated east to west, you can see that the circulation, this is like a sphere drop calculation, you can see that the circulation in the upper ocean is really quite, uh, uh, quite consistent between the products, the reanalysis products, and certainly different from the model simulations. Um, and if we look at the upper southward flow integrated, again, you can see that the mean transports southwards are agreeing with each other quite well, uh, but the upper, uh, and, and they differ from the model simulations. But if we actually continue that integration all the way to the coast, we suddenly find that the overturnings are very different. So what that's telling us is that the interior part of the circulation here is being reproduced quite well, but it's the boundary currents that are, that are failing to be uh, constrained properly. And actually, if you look at, uh, this is from Strammer and Schott, as a, a sort of a schematic of the, uh, of the near equatorial currents, you can see that the reanalyses are capturing that quite well, whereas the model simulations are failing to do so. So I think that's very positive. It's telling you that we're constraining the interior part of the circulation. So if you like, we're constraining the, the gyre component of the circulation, but we're not constraining the overturning circulation of the, compo uh, of the circulation. And you can see that in for the flows confined near the western boundary, this is where all the variability between the products lies. And if you look out in the ocean interior, uh, at all latitudes, there's a fair degree of agreement between the products. So I think that's, that's a very positive, that's a positive step. It's telling us where we need to focus our attention to really understand these issues. Given what's happening to my laptop, I'm going to scoot on quite quickly. This is about looking at ocean heat transport convergences to try and put the ocean transports into context, and this is freshwater flux convergences as well that we can also try to get from these products. An interesting thing here is that it seems that, at least from the reanalysis products, it may be that eddy transports are playing a role. Uh, certainly, some of, these, uh, some of these transports in the reanalysis are considerably larger when you include the eddies than if you only look at the mean component of the transports. That's not true at all latitudes, but it's certainly true at some. Um, I'll let's see. I will skip to here. Um, so, oops. okay. So reanalysis with sparse ocean data. If we want to do 
uh, long reanalyses for things like decadal prediction or 20th century reanalyses, we need to work with very sparse data sets from the past. And of course, this field of decadal prediction took off with this work of Doug Smith in 2007, showing that you could actually get useful multi-year predictions of, uh, of uh, the upper ocean state and the, cl and the climate because of that uh, from, from such reanalyses. So um, the way they did that in this, uh, this Met Office depressor system is rather complex, but essentially what you need to do is you, you need to bring in sp large spatial covariances to spread the small, uh, the small amounts of data over large scales. So what, what is being done essentially in all these methods is to use spatial covariances based on recent observations and the modeling of recent and assimilation of recent observations and use that to spread out past observations which are much more confined in space. Now, this was done in a rather complicated iterative method in the depressor system, uh, but perhaps a more direct approach is now being worked on using uh, EOF covariance models. And this is some work that uh, Dan Lee is currently doing at the Met Office. So this is, a, this is my only slide with, um, uh, with equations on. So this is a standard uh, working model of assimilation in, uh, in model space. Um, but uh, you can also do assimilation in EOF space. So here you're trying to assimilate EOFs around the observations that you have. Or you can build a hybrid system where you do some of your assimilation uh, in model space and some of it in EOF space. And um, this is an experiment where they've essentially taken uh, nine, uh, 2010 sea surface temperatures and um, in situ uh, data positions, and then subsampled these to 1953 observational distributions, and then looked at assimilating that data back in uh, and comparing it against the full data sets. So, uh, so this is your subsampled 2010 data, sort of more or less fitting what you had in 1953. Um, and this is, uh, this, is, this is showing some of the error statistics from that. So, uh, and it's assimilating into a background climatology. So this is data where we haven't, you haven't seen any previous data. And you can see here that the, um, so the background is obviously has quite a high RMS error. This is, C, this is SST and these are the T and S profiles. You can improve that through assimilation. Generally, the standard method is a little bit better than the EOF method. But when you start combining the, uh, in a hybrid method, you can actually beat both of these approaches. And you can actually get larger spatial scales and actually reduce the, the errors. So this is being looked at quite seriously now as a, a new way of assimilating and, and uh, uh, um, sort of running the decadal systems uh, in future. OK, so I was going to just say very briefly something about coupled data assimilation here at the end. I haven't said very much so far, but uh, this, the, the, the new direction is going towards running reanalyses with a full coupled model. Um, there's many advantages to that. Uh, you can certainly recover some of the important issues like surface fluxes of heat and fresh water in a more consistent way uh, because you're actually modeling them rather than... Uh, you, you should be able to use things like sea surface temperature observations much more effectively, wave observations, um, uh, scatterometer wind observations, these are things which are essentially surface quantities and they need to have a consistent ocean and atmospheric boundary layer in order to reproduce good results. So this is just, uh, uh, just showing you one reanalysis product which has been recently produced. It's the coupled 20th century reanalysis from ECMWF and these are just a couple of examples showing you that the, um, the assimilation of the near surface data is, is actually more balanced with this coupled system. So this is comparing with a, um, an ocean-only reanalysis where you're actually getting quite large net heat fluxes and increments as the assimilation is going on, as more data comes in. Uh, and those seem to be much more balanced and the, the mean increments are uh, reduced quite a lot within the coupled system. So that's suggesting that the atmosphere and ocean boundary layers are in a, a better uh, state in the coupled system. So that's really good. I've, that is pretty much where I've, uh, I wanted to get to. Um, just two final slides. Some of this ocean reanalysis work has been done under the 
uh, auspices of this cost project, evaluation of ocean syntheses, and there's still a, this has been running for a couple of years. There's still one and a half years of this to go. Um, and just final advertisement. Um, there is a, a possibility, if people are interested in looking at these reanalysis products, which we want people to do, we want people to use them and find applications for them, uh, there's funding for short-term scientific missions, especially for, uh, uh, for, for young students, like many of yourselves. Um, and you can uh, travel to another cost country and do some research for a period of anywhere between five days and three months. And there's a budget that will cover travel costs for doing that. And obviously, the expectation is that you'll develop new collaborations and, and develop useful uh, research work. And so there are some contact details available if anybody's interested in doing this. So this is still possible for the next uh, year and a half or so. OK, thanks very much. Question to Keith. Uh, you mentioned the assimilation of velocity uh, with different uh, data products or from different platforms. I was wondering uh, if you could also use uh, ship sections or because the later uh, on the later slide you have shown this comparison with this woes section and this is also possible to use such uh, sections for assimilation particularly when you uh, have repeat sections and can estimate some kind of EOF variability patterns and then apply them for example on mooring data also so most of that most of that when I mentioned currents before, it's mainly the geostrophic updates that are being made in relation to the density field changes that you're making. So it's not generally direct current measurements that you're putting in to your system. If you want to put current measurements in, it's quite challenging because you have to be confident that they're geostrophic currents. So I think you'd have to do quite a lot of filtering to try to make, you know, you, because if you put current systems in as they are, I think that this sort of experiment was done originally when altimeter data came along. If, if you just put altimeter data in as a sea level change, you'll produce nice currents, but you essentially produce big barotropic signals, um, which is not the true representation. So you need a covariance relationship to assimilate the currents. And it's still quite challenging to do that. Um, but it, it, it should be possible to do this kind of thing, yes. Um, if, you can, if you've got a good system that's capable of representing you know, the currents at the right levels. <laughs>